we are we're both hip and really into healthcare. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the the music. Um, it got me moving on this bleary Friday morning. All right. So next up is our final. Oh, here's the poll results. So interesting. Um, we asked people when they got their last visit, a telehealth visit, or they or their child, and uh, a lot of people got it within the last uh, month or six months. This is good, but there are some nevers. And then we have the vaccine uh, when they'll get it uh, towards the middle of 2021. All right, cool. All right. Well, thank you all for participating. Um, I, we are back for our final panel on healthcare delivery in a virtual world. Uh, I always say that telehealth was the breakout star of 2020 and uh, virtual care generally has been. Last year we talked a lot about it and this year we've actually seen it in practice. So I'm very excited for today's panel. Um, on today's panel, we've got Dr. Amy Ferenkoff, who's the president of H. SS, Hospital for Special Surgery Healthcare, and also a senior VP at the hospital. We've got Jason Gorovic, who's had a big year, who's CEO of Teladoc Health. Thank you for making time. And Dr. Julie Silverstein, who's divisional president of Oak Street Health, also have had a very big year, so thank you. And our moderator, Kevin Kendra, um, who is research analyst at G Research. So as before, Please put your questions in the Q&A box. If you have comments or chat, chat them, but put your Q&A in the question box. I know that uh, Kevin is moderating it. And so thank you, take it away. Great, thank you, Bonnie, for that introduction. And thank you to everyone, especially our panelists for joining us today. Uh, as we all know, COVID-19 has changed our lives in so many ways, and one of which has been the adoption of technology and the shift to a virtual world. Um, so I'd like to start the conversation there maybe hear from each of you about you know, your place in the healthcare universe and how have you been adjusting to this rapid virtual transition that's been prompted by the pandemic? Uh, perhaps we'll start with you, Dr. Farenkopf. Sure, um, thank you and good morning, everybody. Um, so as, as many people might know, really telehealth was not something um, that was really big in the musculoskeletal orthopedic world um, before COVID. A lot of telehealth was around urgent care, primary care, some mental health. Um, we in, at HSS in uh, 2019 did a total of a thousand telehealth visits and most of those were um, for physical therapy. Um, so we, um, we really had to gear up quickly, um, especially in New York when the shutdown happened it shut down um, elective surgeries, which was about 90% of our volume um, overnight. Um, and uh, we had a lot of patients we needed to connect to. Um, and we went, so we went roughly over a three week period of time from something like 20 visits a week at, at most to about 5,000 visits a week. Um, and we actually, as, a, as opposed to the 1,000 visits we did in 2019, we just hit 100,000 visits um, about two weeks ago and we haven't even finished the year. Um, so uh, it really, changed um, and, and uh, changed HSS in, uh, um, in that it, it showed a lot of the physicians and a lot of patients that, that even for specialty care, this could work. Um, I think for us, it was a lifesaver um, during the shutdown to be able to keep that connection. And now we're really entering into an interesting phase um, because what a lot of, uh, uh, what we've really begun to realize is that telehealth is really just, once we get back to normal, whenever that is going to be. Um, it's, it's, it's a tool in your toolbox. It's one way of being able to interact with your patients the same way that, you know, seeing them in, in person and having surgery is one way of doing it and that there's another set of, of virtual tools. So our focus right now, um, you know, and our, our real goal for 2021 um, is as a specialty hospital focused in musculoskeletal care is defining the omni-channel care model. Um, around orthopedics, rheumatology, um, and, and it's, it's a new care model that will, by service line or maybe even by procedure, is, is identifying that right combination of when someone needs to be seen in person, when it's fine for it to be telehealth, and when really it's about, it's about digital tools and capabilities. So we're all very excited about that and um, 
and this really got us there a lot quicker than we would have otherwise. Great, uh, Jason, I see you you smiling and well deserved, uh, given everything that we've been hearing about telemedicine. Uh, perhaps you could tell us about uh, how Teledoc's been able to, to ramp up for this huge surge of demand that that's been coming since uh, COVID. Yeah. So first, thanks for having me, and uh, you know, I'm um, I'm honored to be on the panel with uh, with two amazing physicians uh, leaders, and uh, and talk a little bit about something I've dedicated the last eleven years of my life to. And um, you know, I, I don't. I think I'm maybe the only one who wasn't surprised uh, that virtual care uh, was able to play the role that it has over the course of the last seven or eight months. Um, I knew it would happen eventually. I didn't think it would take a pandemic uh, to make it happen and make people wake up to the power of connecting with people remotely and, and delivering care on their terms where they are uh, and being able to bring the healthcare system to the consumer as opposed to the other way around. Uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, it's, it's been an amazing transition. I, I, I say at this point, we're probably, we've accelerated the role of virtual care by probably four or five years over the course of about seven months. Uh, and, and that's true among consumer adoption, awareness, adoption, willingness to engage, and, you know, actually the satisfaction scores that go along with it. Provider adoption, where, you know, we heard a lot of reluctance uh, prior to March, and now uh, I hear from, you know, uh, people like Amy all the time. This is great, and the doctors actually really like it. Uh, it's a way to connect differently with consumers and be able to deliver a different kind of care, and in many ways, um, a more personalized, individual, one-on-one -on -one, uh, interaction, which you know the healthcare system has struggled with at times. Um, for us, it was just an amazing overnight, like overwhelming increase in volume. Our volume literally doubled overnight. Um, and the good thing for us is the technology platform was built to, to handle it. Um, we had to onboard a lot of additional physicians though. Uh, you know, it took us a couple of weeks, probably 10 days to really catch up with the volume. And we were, we were onboarding thousands of physicians a day, literally in order to be able to handle the volumes. And, and now what we're seeing is this massive expansion of the clinical use cases and the reason that people are coming to us. You know, infectious disease is down substantially because masks and social distancing don't just prevent the spread of COVID, they prevent the spread of colds and flus and you know, strep throat and things like that, that we would normally be dealing with a lot more at this time in the year. But our volumes stay up because we're seeing so many more people with non-infectious diseases, people with coming to us for hypertension, for lower back pain, for uh, anxiety and depression. Uh, and and it's, it's exciting for me to see people, just the average everyday consumer, embrace virtual care for this broad array of clinical services and, and for their needs because you know, it has the power to really impact people's lives regardless of where they are on sort of the healthcare spectrum. Great, and Dr. Silverstein, can you tell us a bit about kind of what's been happening um, at Oak Street Health as you guys have been navigating this pandemic? Certainly, um, and thanks for having me as well. It's great, fun to think about this and reflect on it. Um, for those who don't know, at Oak Street we provide primary care for the Medicare population. And our model is a high touch, very in-person, see people very frequently, anticipate exacerbation of illness to try to keep people as well as possible, recognizing that in the older population, there are many chronic diseases and many things that can go wrong. Uh, we also pivoted on a dime. I was very proud of how flexible we were but we're probably additionally challenged by the population we serve. In general, the older population has uh, the challenge of utilization of tools that they are, may not be familiar with or comfortable with, uh, may not actually even have a device that could operate um, telemedicine. And in addition, we are generally in lower uh, socioeconomic uh, communities and therefore there are problems with the technology in terms of um, 
even getting a good signal or people having plans that can support the data transmission that's necessary. So even given all of that, we very quickly went from doing 100% in-person in, in care to about 90% virtual care. A good portion of that was telephonic and not video for the reasons I just mentioned. Uh, we saw a lot of what's already been described so much uh, gratitude from our patients and being able to connect. And it's very intense when you just look at somebody on the screen one-to-one. -one. Um, with that said, they generally are people who really enjoy the social nature of a visit to the office. And our model is also built on that. So COVID threw us a one-two in that we stopped being able to do the community gatherings that are one of the strengths of our program um, for obvious reasons. Uh, so I'd say we were highly successful, but we're also um, rapidly pivoting back as much as possible the last week or two excluded when we're facing the challenges perhaps in a renewed way. Um, but uh, we do know that telehealth, whether it's by phone or by video, plays an important role in being able to keep very close tabs on our patients and help them, particularly with the chronic illnesses, Jason, that you were mentioning, um, which is not the usual way we think about um, the telemedicine platform. Yeah, so it sounds like, you know, in your practice or at Oak Street Health, it makes sense that at some point it's gonna roll back and won't be as certainly as virtual as it's been. Uh, but what sort of place going forward, how much of a role uh, do you see telemedicine playing among that Medicare population given some of the, uh, the challenges you noted? Yeah, good question. So we pivoted back as quickly as possible. I mean, part of what allowed us to do more in-person care was the rapid knowledge that we're gaining over COVID and understanding how to protect ourselves, our patients, and our, our colleagues, and our, our staff. Uh, so we've done a good job of protecting ourselves and each other so that we can do a lot of in-person care. With that said, we continue to do 10 to 20 percent of our work virtually, depending on the part of the country that we're talking about. Uh, we are also in the process of trying to answer that question, Kevin, more completely. What exactly should be the role? I believe that it's in that uh, I think we've learned that we can see some of our visits virtually um, and make things more convenient for our patients and maybe give them even more intense um, attention by using virtual tools. Um, on the other hand, we saw mortality go up significantly during this period. It's no secret that people were not getting the preventive care they need, the disease management care that they, that they deserve. And uh, overall in the Medicare population, not just Oak Street, mortality went up in 2020, COVID aside, uh, compared to 2019, even if we exclude those deaths. So we are strong believers in our care model and we know the power of the visit. And so I think we'll come up with a blend that's a little bit more like a, an 80-20 in favoring in-person, but we have a lot to learn still. And certainly this next surge is another platform to learn more. You mentioned, you know, the patients dealing with, with other chronic conditions alongside COVID. And it brings me to a question I specifically want to ask you, Jason, uh, about Teladoc's recently completed merger with Livongo. It's one of the biggest healthcare deals of 2020. Uh, so, so what are the trends and opportunities that you see with this combined company now that convinced you to go out and spend roughly $19 billion in cash and stock uh, to do this sizable deal? What is, what's really has you excited about the Livongo uh, Teladoc opportunity? Yeah, so uh, thanks for pointing out that price tag. Um, so, you know, uh, we, as, as you, you heard me say, I think, I think the, the role of virtual care has accelerated dramatically four or five years. And we saw a number of trends. One, consumers looking for whole person care, right? To be able to go to a destination, to a provider, to a resource to take care of their entire person, not just their diabetes or not just for urgent care, um, not just for mental health care, but for you know their, their health care. Uh, and so bringing together uh, the leader in chronic care management with uh, the leader in sort of what's on both ends of that spectrum, acute care with our general medicine services, with our pediatric services, things like that, but also um, our uh, more complex uh, conditions with our expert second opinion services and things like that. So 
we really now have the, the full scope ranging, ranging from episodic acute all the way to complex. Now there are plenty of things we can't do virtually, right? We're not you know, operating on someone's knee uh, virtually and, and, and therefore it's really important that we integrate with the overall healthcare system uh, seamlessly so that we can get people the right care that they need. But there is, there is no question to me, and I, I'll give you an example. We just did a pilot for virtual primary care. And uh, you know, it, it was amazing the breadth of diagnoses uh, that we saw, over 70 different diagnoses. And top diagnoses included uh, diabetes, prediabetes, hypertension, prehypertension, uh, anxiety, depression, obesity. You know, these are all things that um, are longitudinal in nature and the Livongo capabilities combined with the rest of our, uh, our, our clinical and, and technology assets really round out that, uh, that delivery model. So um, it's, a, it's, it's a category defining combination uh, and and I, I think it was an inevitable combination. Uh, the pandemic just accelerated it because it, it increased the market readiness. Uh, and, and it was clear that the time was now to do it. It was hard to get done during a pandemic when we were all socially distanced uh, and had to negotiate over Zoom. Uh, but, uh, but it's been really great. And, and the common mission of the two companies has made that integration a lot more successful. You mentioned you can't, you know, exactly repair an ACL or replace a hip uh, over an iPad, at least not yet. Um, I want to ask Dr. Farenkopf, how do you see the opportunity with things like Livongo, Teladoc, uh, with the different technologies that are out there uh, to be in front of your patients at hospital for special surgery and, and help them with either aftercare or perhaps more ideally, uh, with care that may potentially keep them off the operating table. Yeah, this is, uh, we're really excited about the potential. Um, so uh, I, just to be clear, I, so I run all of our digital strategy at HSS, but I also um, am president of HSS Health, which is our commercialization arm. You might think of it as sort of the optimum of HSS. Um, and I'm excited on both sides of that because I think as I said, I, I think musculoskeletal care, uh, it's, it's definitely one of those areas where there hasn't been as much of a care model approach. Um, it's, it's, there hasn't necessarily been as much of a prevention approach. Um, and so when you think really more broadly, beyond, I mean, telehealth being an important tool, but more broadly around digital tools, capabilities, um, very similar to what Jason just mentioned, where of what like Livongo can do with chronic care, and, but with, with us think, well, we do have chronic conditions we take care of. We have a big rheumatology department um, and that, that's obviously um, a chronic care area as is chronic. And, but what I get excited about um, is not just what we could do with them, but thinking about episodes of care, which is what a lot of um, surgical episodes are. And, and being the trendsetter um, or you know, really setting the standard of what are the right tools and capabilities you need for that? Because it's very different than, than what, uh, you know, some of the great work Livongo's done with diabetics, for instance, where this is a chronic disease, there's a behavior management piece that goes long-term. For this, you're talking sometimes about a six, eight week period of time, very intense. Um, this is not behavior change that has to last forever. And it's very important that you engage patients um, and, uh, and engage them in the recovery as well as um, maybe bring in new data that you haven't had traditionally. So when we look around this care model, we're looking at, you know, maybe we know you have to do, uh, you know, for hip replacement, the first visit in person, obviously the surgery has to be in person, but how to, we're building a platform that in between, you know, it gets triggered by your surgery being um, scheduled. And as soon as that happens, you get digital education through the platform, you get introduced um, to your, who your physical therapist is going to be. We don't have this yet, but we're envisioning um, the ability to do some basic um, range of motion capture with your phone, uh, where you set a standard and, set a, and, and ask some, some um, simple questions about baseline pain and activity. 
that then as you go forward, you can imagine, you know, right now our surgeons don't really get very much information between the surgery and the post-op visit six weeks later. They might have a patient who calls, but things could go off track during that time that they may not know about, especially if physical therapy is happening somewhere else. So thinking through what are the pieces of information that if they knew at the one week or two week um, point might have them come back into the, the hospital or place a phone call to check on them. So simple things around pain, are you able to go to the bathroom on your own? Um, and those pieces of information, but also bringing in how many steps are, are, are they having? Are they actually completing um, physical, you know, between physical therapy sessions can you assign them digital and instead of that PDF? I, I've had, unfortunately, many orthopedic procedures and you get handed a PDF with like some of the exercises, you know, crossed off and some circle and we'll only do this on this leg. But instead, if you have a digital um, exercise in between, it's assigned by your physical therapist and, and you actually can see if they completed it or not and how many times they completed it. And that data coming in and then being able to flag to the doctor at the two week time, you know, look, the steps are going down, actually. Pain, we, we're monitoring pain, it's, pain seems to be going up. Maybe the, the um, you need to schedule a telehealth visit then and still, instead of waiting to the six week mark. Um, so we're, and we're also looking at some of the advances with um, telehealth itself. Most of it, you know, is very simple platform. Um, uh, and it's really more about the juice of the docs and what, you know, that, that interaction. but. In musculoskeletal health, you can have um, really interesting, this doesn't work for every specialty, but we're looking at asynchronous exams, um, which can be almost a digital record of what someone's baseline is. And that movement, you know, that's going to be different. You're not, you know, an asynchronous exam won't work necessarily for mental health or for, you know, diabetes, diabetes the blood sugar is the, is the asynchronous exam. Um, but, but thinking about sort of new technology and how that can be used um, with telehealth as one of these tools. So we're, we're really excited about this. HSS is a, is a worldwide leader uh, in, in quality and outcomes for musculoskeletal health. And so we believe we, we should be at the forefront of helping define, you know, what this new care model could be. Great, actually, an ACL surgery at HSS, and a lot of the stuff would have been really cool to have back then. Um, I had it, I had it there too, just so you know. <laughs> I had ACL surgery there too. Uh, well, I would hope you had it there. Um, we'll pivot. I want to pivot to something that came up in the last panel, and that was about social determinants of healthcare. And we know that different things like socioeconomic status, race, and even geography can impact the outcomes that you see in healthcare. Uh, maybe I'll start with you, Dr. Silverstein. How can we use these tools, telemedicine, AI, machine learning, all these things that are now coming to the forefront in order to make sure that we can improve on these challenges that we see with social determinants? And I think more importantly, make sure that we don't make them worse. I think the second half of that question is really important, Kevin. Um, you know, so there are a number of very small things that we've tried to do at Oak Street to pivot to address some of it, even as simple as bring a device to somebody's home, turn it on for them, set them up and let them have the visit. And actually that works quite well. So it, it you know, we bring it with the Wi-Fi and we can get over some of those barriers. Um, it's an intense uh, service to offer. And um, but for those who can't get out, I think it can be very helpful. You mentioned in the beginning of your question about AI. I, I think that's really important. It's another very um, appropriate thing to think about right now. So we've worked really hard on our population health platform and population health analytics. And one of the things that's been one of um, the strongest opportunities is actually to build in those social determinants of health, if you will, those potentially negative predictors into our algorithms that help us identify which patients we really need to pay attention to. So we actually um, do a clinical exercise where we estimate how quote unquote sick we think someone is and we intensify our services if we think that the if we perceive the patient at greater risk. Um, we've been able to use some of the newer technologies to employ not just retrospective data into our quantification of that risk, but also some other things that have to do with um, the outcomes of research on 
uh, predictors and social determinants. So our, we've recently redone our predictive modeling and we are um, much uh, better actually at capturing or identifying who is going to have a higher mortality. And we can intervene with our model in a more specific way when we do that. I think that those things will help us potentially close the gap. And that's a very different place to be than on the utilization of technolo technology as a platform for healthcare delivery, because this is in the, in the predictive part of, of our model and kind of where to institute that very intensive hands-on intervention. Great, Jason, I'm sure this is something that you guys have been looking to tackle you know, for years now. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I appreciate uh, the question. This is something that we're very passionate about. I really see virtual care as the great equalizer, democratizing healthcare. I mean, think about the Livongo devices. You have a connected uh, uh, blood glucose meter. You have a connected uh, blood pressure cuff. You have a connected scale. All of them work off of cellular using 3G, right? So you don't need, you know, this isn't something where you have to do a Bluetooth connection to some device and be connected to a Wi-Fi in your home. And, and, and we've purposefully gone to that lowest common denominator such that we can engage the full population uh, regardless of where they are. You know, our in-touch business is in hospitals and health systems all around the, the world, enabling them to bring specialists remotely into their facilities so that even in a rural or inner city hospital, you can bring in a, a neonatologist or a, a vascular neurologist uh, such that they can see the, the consumer um, regard, without actually having to be there in that location. And then mental health care for me is like probably the pinnacle of this. You know, most of the communities we're talking about are underserved overall by health by the healthcare system, and especially when it comes to mental health care. But the ability to connect with a therapist, a psychologist, a psychiatrist remotely without having to, you know, move into some other part of town or, you know, figure out how to navigate your way through the system and ask somebody who they'd recommend, uh, who probably has never even thought about the mental health care system is really, really powerful. And to Julie's point, a lot of that can be done over the phone, right? I mean, certainly we do lots of video visits and our incidence of video visits is up significantly since the beginning of the pandemic for reasons just like we have conferences like this now. Uh, but but we've always supported a multimodal uh, 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 model where it's really up to the consumer how they want to connect with us unless it's clinically necessary, right? So if a consumer wants to have a phone call, that's great. You know, I had early in, early in the pandemic, I had a sty. Uh, and so I uploaded two pictures and then had a video visit and the doctor sort of knew what was going on already and then looked at my eye through the video visit and was able to take care of me that's something that really needed to be visualized. But a mental health care visit can be very well done uh, telephonically. And you know, to the point that, uh, that you all have made earlier, you can apply really good science uh, against that. So we're starting to apply uh, AI and natural language processing against some of those phone interactions to even better inform the therapist of nuances in the voice uh, inflection, uh, you know, changes in the, the um, words that are being used in order to really measure sentiment uh, and mental health. And I think there's almost unlimited opportunity there. Yeah, I'd like I just before you we move on, I want to tag on to that, Jason, because I'm really glad you brought up mental health. Extremely important. We actually have an unusual model in that we employ some mental health providers to do telehealth with our patients, but we bring them to our centers to have the visit. So it's the it's since providers are limited, we have the provider stay put and we have we bring the patients as if they're coming to see the patient live, but they see them on a screen. And that has worked for several years at Oak Street to help us with, with distribution of resources and um, and really kind of get our services to where they need to be. And again, allows the patient to still be in a community environment, but they're actually having a virtual visit on site. Um, the other thing that came to mind that I didn't mention is that we also have a pretty sophisticated system for e-consults. And so another way to provide virtual care to patients 
might not even require their participation when the primary care person consults the specialist with the information they need in a virtual world, excluding the patient until they communicate back with primary care. So there are a few different ways to flip the switch to use the technology that don't depend as much on user skill. Um, and that I think is part of that equalizer piece um, when we use those other non-traditional ways and help the patient get access. Yeah, I might add here too, you know, we don't, um, everything, I agree with everything that, that Julie and Jason said, you know, we, we don't think a lot about the, um, some of the unseen barriers to care um, and the, just the amount of time and sometimes money for parking or tools it takes to actually go to the doctor. And then if you think about that again, within a surgical episode, you not only have the the, the initial visit, the, you know, the needs for labs, radiology, the actual surgery, and then all of the PT that happens within a six to eight uh, week period of time and how much that can, that just is absolutely preventative if someone has to go somewhere, depending on your job. Um, you know, you could lose hours in the day trying to do that. So the ability to do, you know, telept, we have seen unbelievable results um, from going to almost entirely telept post-surgically. Um, we were already doing some of that with our um, with our Medicare population as part of our bundles, but we, we've really seen great outcomes and great satisfaction, but you, that can be used in other, um, for other populations where it's just that barrier to physically getting somewhere and the time it takes. I would also say, you know, post-surgically, you can have somebody who is relative, who has social um, challenges, but is relatively stable until there's an event. So, um, you know, uh, especially if you're talking about, you know, loneliness and that aspects of, of social determinants, which a lot of the elderly have, others have where you, you might be on the brink economically and you live by yourself and you can manage, but the minute you have surgery, um, you know, you can have an issue where you're not getting any food, you're not getting, you don't have access to that. So the ability to have these additional tools post-surgically where, 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 you know, that event, um, and the event could be something like a stroke or something else, obviously, as well, but, but at least for us, how does a surgical event change someone's ability to cope um, with their social determinant? So, um, you know, I think it's, it, it, it has great, um, it has great, um, potential as an equalizer, as long as we, um, you know, we're just the way that we're, we've been concerned about this with kids with the, with the remote learning, as long as the, some of the, the wireless um, uh, access issues are, are, are fixed, because that's the, probably the biggest challenge. Almost everybody now has a phone at least, um, but the, the um, very, variability in, in access to good internet is, is probably the, the biggest challenge. Great. I did want to ask about you know, healthcare costs. Are obvi it's obviously a big part of healthcare is the cost of healthcare. Uh, and technology, virtual medicine, all of the promise to, to help reduce those costs. So can you talk about what you've seen in the time, you know, in the last nine months since you've seen increased utilization? Uh, what has it done for the opportunity to take costs down for payers, to take costs down uh, for patients? Maybe. I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Uh, sure. I mean, obviously telehealth in and of itself, I don't think, um, and, and Jason can correct me if I'm wrong, but just the concept of telehealth in and of itself probably won't reduce costs massively. Um, it's how you use it with other tools, right? That, and, and how you use, use it again as part of a care model that, that has potential. The only thing I could see that telehealth in and of itself might help is if people have access to higher quality clinicians. So as, as an example, you know, we, uh, with our physical therapists, we generally see, um, you know, 70% of the physical therapy visits that you'll get at other, um, um, uh, at other physical therapy sites. Quality is good. People can stop earlier because it's really, really good quality. So that good quality physical therapy um, new people have access to it, that can, that is an example of reducing costs. And you could imagine that's one example, but in other specialties, that being true. 
But, um, you know, I, I look at it more as, you know, again, if you go back to what I mentioned about how do you get information earlier, um, not necessarily telehealth, but with, with digital tools about the post-surgical patient who turns out right around a week or to two weeks is starting to go downhill and you're getting actual data in any number of ways on that, you can intervene and actually prevent a readmission or um, prevent actually having to do a revision down the line, something like that by getting, by involving, you know, virtual care, whether that's digital tools, digital collection of information. Um, and so I think thinking about it more as a, is, as that care model, um, and that's what Livongo does, right, is, is having those touch points virtually, it doesn't have to be telehealth, be chatting with somebody um, and just checking in immediately when the blood sugar looks off rather than waiting for the three month visit and looking back at the hemoglobin A1C. <laughs> You're doing it more, you know, proactively. So um, I, I, think, um, I think there is great, great potential as long as, and this is the key, and I'm sure Julie would agree with this too, doctors already have a massive amount of data to look at, sometimes too much data. So as new forms of data come in, um, I think it just has to be uh, presented to them or have an ability for them to actually use it and not just be more data that, uh, you know, especially if you're coming in through Epic, how do you even find it, right? It has to be easy to use and easy for them to see and maybe easy to be flagged or it'll be ignored because it just goes into the noise. Yeah, so um, I'll jump in quickly. I have a lot to say here. So Kevin, you might have to cut me off. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the data is really powerful. So 25% um, of pediatric ER visits are for sore throats, fever with no other symptoms, upper respiratory infections, uh, and, and, so you, and earaches, that's the, that's the fourth. So 25% of pediatric ER visits, uh, the, the opportunity to get the right level of care to the consumer increases dramatically. 50% of our general medical visits are nights, weekends, and holidays when the doctor's office is closed, right? And so using the ER for primary care or urgent care is not efficient, but it's the only thing available, or at least it was until services like ours were available. And so the data that we uh, run on matched populations demonstrates that about $472 of healthcare costs uh, are avoided uh, on average when someone uses our service instead of going into the physical delivery system. And that's obviously a weighted average because some people are going to their primary care doctor's office, some people are going to an urgent care, and some people are racking up thousands of dollars of bills in an emergency room unnecessarily. The Livongo data is really powerful. It's almost $2,000 savings uh, per user per year for someone who's engaged with the Livongo diabetes uh, management program. And that's an example of one where you're really getting a, a, a one-to-many or a many-to-many -many, uh, opportunity to leverage technology because the data comes in, you apply data science to it, you can nudge the consumer with health nudges to remind them to go for a walk or remind them to, uh, to watch what they're eating or, uh, or you know, make sure that they're doing the things that they need to be doing in order to avoid unnecessary exacerbations. And, and, and that is true across the, the full spectrum of, uh, of chronic conditions. And then lastly, I'm gonna go back to my comments on mental health care. You know, anxiety and depression result in things like binge eating and problems sleeping and lack of motivation to exercise. And so if you don't have access to those resources, you're likely to get exacerbations across other things like your blood pressure, like weight gain, like your diabetes uh, and, and having your sugars uh, go out of control. So it, 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 is a, it is a multifaceted answer to the question about reducing healthcare costs. Um, and as Amy says, it's a combination and it's different for different clinical use cases in different situations. And it's not just about the telemedicine itself, but it's about how you use the data in order to really improve outcomes and improve care. I, I 
think also I would be remiss if I didn't add in that it matters what your payment system is. So everything you described, Jason, is right on target, especially with the cost of care of emergency room visits, et cetera, and things where we're substituting lower cost interventions for inappropriately high cost interventions. It, we're operating in a value, total value-based full risk system at Oak Street. And so for us, the it's more about the second part of your answer, which is the outcomes of the interventions and what type of technology we're using. Because when you're being paid to take care of a person as a whole, X amount of dollars for a given year, it doesn't matter if you see them in person or you call them on the phone or you have video capabilities as long as you're taking care of them. And so I do think, no, it's still expensive to go to the ER. So we still don't want that. But I, I think that the question and the way you answer it really does depend on the application and the situation and the payment model, which we shouldn't forget that a lot of the reason why we worry about this cost of care issue is born out of the challenges with our payment model in the, in the country. Yeah, Julie, I think that's exactly right. We're, we're hearing a lot, you know, we have a, a large um, customer base of hospitals and health systems. And one of the audiences that was most excited about us uh, coming together with Livongo were, were those hospitals and health systems, especially those who are taking risk, right? Who are in a situation where they're in a value-based reimbursement or they're in an ACO or something like that because they wanna be able to take advantage of that technology to more efficiently and effectively manage the cost of that population. Uh, and so I, I, I had that as a hypothesis before we did the deal and literally they came out in droves to say, when can we get access to that? How can we integrate it with our overall telemedicine platform to be able to take advantage and reduce the cost of care? Great. Uh Got a few questions that have been coming in. Uh, maybe the first one, have you seen a change in, in the way that doctors are, are offering care and specifically uh, a change in prescribing patterns uh, given telehealth versus in-person visits? Maybe I should take that. I I think it's a little hard. I'm not. I'm, it sounds like the person who's asking the question has something very specific in mind, and I'm not sure that I can get at what it is. Um, you know, the challenge is always how much do we prescribe on the phone, quote unquote, versus need a visit, and what's the definition of a visit to a given provider, and that's very much at the discretion of the provider. It also matters if you're talking about acute illness and prescribing versus chronic. Uh, we give out way too many antibiotics in general. Uh, one would think that if we had an adequate visit, with, whether it was a telemedicine visit um, or an in-person visit, we could make an appropriate um, decision. I think there is, I'm totally guessing, but I actually think we prescribe less when we do virtual care than actually in person. We, there's a little less of that direct pressure on the individual. But but the overall answer to the question, I think, is we shouldn't expect to see different prescribing habits based on a, a virtual visit versus an in-person visit. I, we'd like to uphold a uniform standard of care. I don't know if anyone differs with me, but I'm really just uh, speculating. Well, I'm, I'm not a doctor, so I'm a little uh, on the edge, uh, but, but I can tell you what we do from a quality perspective. Um, for a long time, we've heard the, the question about, um, is there overprescribing of antibiotics when you can't do a swab or, uh, you know, or, or a culture? And, and so for a long time, we've actually measured um, as an aggregate, as well as on a physician specific basis, the uh, prescribing rate of antibiotics for upper respiratory infections, as well as corticosteroids, because um, sometimes that's used as a sort of um, convenient substitute. Um, and we actually uh, run below uh, the brick and mortar numbers uh, in terms of prescribing rates. Um, there, there are also uh, just you know regulatory constraints. So you can't prescribe any controlled substances uh, over a telemedicine visit. Um, unless you've seen the patient in person uh, previously. Uh, and so, um, you know, we are uh, strictly adhering to those, uh, those restrictions as well. Yeah, great, we've got another question about, uh, about geographic reach. Obviously, you know, Oak Street Health, um, HSS have, have physical footprints, but has the expansion of telemedicine and virtual care 
allowed you to expand your geographic reach to, to new patient populations that ordinarily may not um, come in to see you? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, obviously, um, uh, there, there were some licensing um, restrictions that were uh, loosened during the pandemic, some of which are still in place, some not. That has been, you know, probably the biggest, uh, the biggest challenge we would face in going much outside of the tri-state area. That being said, um, even within the tri-state area and Florida, we have a we have a um, hospital in Florida. Um, obviously, we can go much much further outside of the New York metropolitan area within the within the tri-state area and access new um, new patients in that way. Um, you know, I think for us, uh, there will be, we, we are looking at ways to be able to expand outside of our footprint, um, especially for things like physical therapy, um, because we think that could have a huge effect. Um, with, with surgery though, obviously, um, there is, and uh, I should say actually for rheumatology, it would be a huge help as many people know there's, there's a, a not nearly enough rheumatologists in the country for the number of people that have issues and, and number of patients have to drive quite far to, to get to a good rheumatologist. And so what, you know, what can we do there on, on uh, licensing? Um, I think for us, there's, there's more interest in, in the expansion around physical therapy and physiatry than, than surgeons because a lot of the value for, for us of those surgery visits are for people who will actually have surgery. Um, so, you know, expanding so that our surgeons can do visits in, in California, for instance, is not really that helpful to us unless they're actually going to come and have surgery with us. Um, so, um, uh, but with our physiatrists and, and our physical therapists, there, there's quite a bit we can do nationwide. So we're looking into options um, to get around, um, not to get around the licensure. I mean, some of it might be that we hire physical therapists in other places. We have a national physical therapy um, uh, network that we work with, and we're trying to figure out if we can harness the power of that. Um, but um, with the licensure rules, um, it, you, for us, that, that's probably one of the biggest, you know, and Teladoc obviously has doctors in multiple different states, which is different than us. So that's probably the biggest challenge that we've had. I think it's a really good question. For us, it's about the panel. So we established relationships. We wouldn't expand using telehealth. However, we found it extremely helpful. We're a rapid growth company going into new states all the time. You start with one doc, two docs, one nurse practitioner. Um, it's helped with coverage. The the As Amy mentioned, the regulations licensure is a barrier. But because the tools were available universal, universally around the organization, we were able to have a doctor that's physically sitting in North Carolina cover the person in Texas because they're all on their own. And that's been really helpful. Um, we use, we wanna use our own network in this, and it does allow us to reach beyond um, borders that we weren't able to reach to before. Great. Jason, did you have any thoughts on that? It, it's not exactly the same, uh, an answer to the same question. Uh, Amy's right. We have a national network of physicians. Uh, so for, you know, 10 plus years, we've been connecting patients with a physician who's licensed in their local state where they are at the time. Um, what I would say, one of the things that's going to be interesting that we should all watch for is whether the federal government gets the power to suspend the state licensure requirements during a national emergency. That's something that Secretary Azar was really frustrated by. Um, the White House was incredibly frustrated uh, that they couldn't um, suspend those state licensure requirements because it's state; those are states' rights, right? And the states don't like to give up those rights. And yet uh, we saw a situation where um, it would have been incredibly helpful to be able to bring resources to the places that were most affected uh, and do that virtually. And it would have made for better care, better access to care, um, and probably had a real impact on the, on the um, course of the pandemic if we could have done that. So um, I, that's something I would watch for uh, in the next you know, couple of legislative sessions to see if the federal government can do that. And there are powerful forces on both sides of it. 
Great. Um, sticking with you, Jason, did get the question of, of how is TELDOC able to work with, you know, places like HSS or Oak Street Health in order to do uh, kind of a hybrid model of care with in-person and virtual? Yeah, so um, a couple of different ways. One is we have a whole part of our business, which is taking our technology platform and licensing it um, and integrating it for uh, hospitals and health systems and provider groups, large multi-specialty provider groups, such that they can take advantage of our platform in order to deliver care to their patient populations. Um, in many of those cases, they want it probably not for HSS because it's such a specialized uh, set of conditions, um, but for more, uh, you know, hospital systems who are looking to stand up more of like a virtual urgent care center um, or virtual primary care initiatives, they frequently take advantage of our physician network as excess coverage, either to expand capacity to get nights and weekends coverage, things like that. Um, and then, you know, I, I mentioned we're, we're, we're leaning really hard into virtual primary care and virtual, with virtual primary care, we're trying hard to, to really reimagine um, what the primary care experience is. Um, you know, not, not unlike what Julie's doing at Oak Street, just maybe from a different angle. Um, and that includes things like really deeply connecting with your Apple Health Kit so that we can collect the data that Amy was talking about, about your steps and your sleep patterns and things like that. Um, and the ability to then do that and bring a whole care team like Julie does of, you know, not just a physician, but also um, a therapist and a registered dietitian and specialists as well as primary care physicians um, all to bear. And so we're really looking to figure out how we can package that up and then bring modules or the whole thing to uh, physician offices such that they can take advantage of the technology, including things like the Livongo technology, as well as some of those human resources, because you know, having access to a national network of therapists is probably better than just referring everybody to the therapist who happens to be down the hall in your office building. Great. Uh, well, I think that pretty much takes us uh, just about to, to the end. I did want to ask one final question and real quickly, just can you identify an area in the virtual world that has you most excited in healthcare as we look out for the next, say, five to 10 years? Maybe we'll start with, uh, with you, Dr. Silverstein. I have to answer that. My current horizon is about five to 10 days maybe with everything that's going on. Uh, so I probably don't have a really long-term vision. I think that some of the things we mentioned, the combination of getting more information to help us in the predictive modeling and kind of figuring out how to differentiate the care that we deliver is something that's very um, exciting to me. I also think that understanding how to weave in, and, and we spoke to this also, the integration of some of the tools and the, you know, we're gonna have endless capabilities of, of gadgets and things to throw at people, but figuring out how to incorporate those into comprehensive care plans. I actually look forward to figuring out how to use the technology we already have to create the systems where they're best utilized and getting some research done on figuring out uh, what exactly what we should focus on. Um, looking at people like Jason to help us with that as we as we just try to take care of our communities. Great. Dr. Barankoff? Yeah, I think um, somewhat somewhat similar uh, answer, but with you know different purpose. Obviously, I'm I'm very focused in in one space, but you know the the great thing about um, musculoskeletal care is so much of it is physical and visual, um, and so being able to have tools that can really you know as an example, um, where we were looking at a, a tool the other day that with uh, that can uh, with an exam actually measure an, a degree of range of motion. We're not talking about something that, you know, is is massively futuristic. And, and one of our surgeons, who's one of our best surgeons said, you know, I usually just eyeball that. I don't even get, I, I never measure it. Um, and so the idea that there could be this really easy way to measure something over time. And again, you know, how do you use bringing in 
steps, which is something everyone's talked about for so long, but if you're bringing it in for very specific use of using that to track post-surgical recovery, you know, you actually have a, a real way of, of, of using it. So I think integrating these, these simple, we're not talking about something massively um, complicated, these simple digital tools um, to, to, change, uh, to change how care is delivered um, and actually, you know, hopefully really get to better outcomes um, and, and lower costs, which is what we all want. Um, I, I think that uh, for me, there's just, there's a, there's a ton of opportunity and it's, it's not even a five-year horizon. I think some of this opportunity can be captured in the next year to two years. It's all just sitting there for healthcare to capture. Uh, we just haven't traditionally done a great job of it. So um, I'll try to be quick because I know that we're at time. Um, I, I, you know, we think about it as combining the best human expertise with um, data science and technology to create real insights uh, to improve and personalize the healthcare experience for consumers and deliver better in-time insights for physicians such that they can actually deliver better care, right? And, and it, it's exactly what Amy said. There's a ton of data and an epic system. It just doesn't deliver the value it should because it's not delivering real insights. And so I think the combination of those things combined with access to the best care by democratizing it through the use of technology really has uh, just an incredible opportunity to revolutionize the healthcare system and improve the healthcare experience, both for consumers and for providers. And so that we are like, that is all about our mission. Uh, and, and so, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly excited about that. Great. So thankful to all of you. It's so great to have you. And I think I'll turn it over to Bunny.